Hello everyone and welcome to task number four. I'm very excited because in this task, we are going to understand the theory and intuition behind k-means clustering. All right, if you guys remember from the previous lecture in task number three, we have been able to do some data visualization. So we visualized our uh, dist plot, we visualized the histogram along with KDE plot, we plot the correlations, and now we are very familiar with the data, and we have cleaned up the data as well, and we filled up missing um, uh, or NAN or not a number of values. So let's go ahead, understand the theory and intuition behind k-means. So k-means is an unsupervised learning algorithm. And k-means simply work by grouping data points together or perform what we call it clustering in an unsupervised fashion. Simply put, let's assume that we have two features. These are the savings, and here we have the age, okay? And we are trying to group a couple of these, let's say, customers based on their features that are savings and age. So we plot out these couple of points, and now what we wanted to do is that we wanted to see if we can divide these customers into groups, okay? Obviously, we as humans, it's very easy for us to say, you know what, this is the first cluster, this is the second one, this is the third one, and so on. And that's what k-means does, but it does that in a very, very sm using a very, very smart algorithm. And you can implement that in a computer, and you can do it to any data without even visualizing it. And that's the beauty of it. Simply put, you feed in the algorithm with these data points. Again, there is no labels here. We don't have a target label. We only have a bunch of data points. We just have the X and Y for every single input. And what k-means does, it just simply go there and cluster them in this fashion. So it will say, okay, all these, all these belong to the blue category. All these four points belong to the red category. And these points belong to the green category. And that's basically what k-means does. So the algorithm groups observations with similar attribute values together by measuring what we call the Euclidean distance between points. I'm going to show you guys what do I mean by this. So let's take a look at the k-means algorithm from a very high level. That's how the algorithm works, and we're going to learn how to apply it and actually program it. It's very, very easy and straightforward. So first, we have to choose the number of clusters, k. Here, in this case, it was very obvious to us that we only have three clusters. But in reality, you might have a lot more complex data. And I don't know how many clusters do I need. And actually, I'm going to show you guys afterwards if there is a technique uh, that you could, you could use to come up with the optimal number of clusters. So first, we are going to choose the number of clusters, okay? The second point is that we're going to select random k points that are going to be the centroids of each cluster. So that will be the second step. Again, I know it might sound a little bit confusing, so that's okay. Hang in there. I'm just going to walk you through the algorithm, and we'll see that visually afterwards. So after we select the random key points, we assign each data point to the nearest centroid, and by doing so, we will, that will enable us to create k number of clusters. And then in step number four, we are going to calculate a new centroid for each cluster. And then step five, we are going to reassign each data point to the new closest centroid. And then we go to step four, we keep repeating, step four, repeating, stop four, repeating, and until the algorithm basically stops. All right, so let's go ahead and see that visually, okay? So now I have my data points, okay? That's all what I have. And I wanted to apply k-means clustering. So what I would do is I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to assume I only have two clusters. So first, I'm going to choose the number of clusters, k. So I'm going to say k equals to 2 in this case. So now I have k equals to 2. That's good. Second step, I'm going to select random k points, which is two points, that are going to be the centroids for each cluster. So I'm going to go there randomly. I'm going to put the star here for the green cluster. I'm going to put the red here for the other cluster. I know, again, this is initialization. This is just in the beginning. I'm just going to throw two centroids somewhere. I know they are wrong. 
but I was just going to put them somewhere. So that's what we have done here. The first step this afterwards is that we're going to assign each data point to the nearest centroid. And by doing so, that will enable us to create k numbers of clusters. So what I'm going to do here, simply put, I'm just going to calculate the distance between each of the points, like let's say this point. Is this point closer to the green or closer to the red centroid? Well, this is close to the green. Well, so this one, this point, will belong to the green cluster. What about this point? The same thing. It's closer to the green, so it will belong to this one. This one, again, belong to the green. This one belong to the green. While these, all of them, are much closer to the red cluster. And that's why what we're going to be doing here is that we're going to assign each data point to the nearest centroid. And that's what we've done here. So all these basically points have been classified to the green cluster, and all these red have been assigned to the red cluster. All right? Okay, looks great. Very easy and very straightforward. The next step, step number four, we are going to calculate a new centroid for each cluster. So as you guys can see, now I have a new cluster, right? I have cluster red and I have cluster green. So what I could do right now is that I wanted to move or shift my centroid here to, the, to a new place, to the new location of my new points, right? So think of centroid as kind of the center of the, uh, the, the, uh, the gravity. I just want to like localize all these centroids here to the actual center of all these weights, of all these data points. And that's where the centroid comes, uh, comes in. So what I'm going to do here is I need to move the star to shift it up to become here to the centroid of my new data points. And this green will have to move here to become the new centroid for my green cluster. All right, looks great. And step number five, I'm going to reassign each data point to my new closest centroid. So as you guys can see here, now I have to, again, do the math again. Okay, so now I have these two new centroids. I have to repeat again. I have to see, okay, are these points closer to the red or closer to the green? And I keep repeating and basically going back and going to step number four, five, six, and going back to four, five, six. And I keep repeating or going through all that loop until I basically come up or have the optimal or the best uh, um, clusters based on the values of the K that I assigned beforehand. Okay. All right. I hope you guys were able to uh, understand that. The obviously the next question, which is the uh, important question. Okay. Like how can I choose K? So this is actually the initial problem here. What is the optimal number of K? Should K be equal to two, three, five, nine? I don't know. So what's good about that is there is an actual technique that I could apply, again, without doing any visualization, without even plotting the data points, I can simply go there and apply what we call it the elbow method, okay? And it's simply a technique that could be used to tell me what is the optimal number of clusters. All right, so let's take a look at it here visually. So let's assume that I have three clusters, as you guys can see here. I have cluster red, and these are PI, these are all the points that belong to the cluster red. And I have the centroid of the red cluster. We call it C1, the centroid one. For the blue points, I have all these data points. These are PI. And I have C3, and that's cluster number three. And that's the centroid of my cluster three. Here I have the, um, um, the orange one or the yellow ones. As you guys can see here, I have all these points and I have the centroid of cluster number two. So what I could do to apply the elbow method is that I can go here and calculate something called, or a variable called, within cluster sum of squares, or WCSS. I know the equation sounds intimate or looks intimidating, but it's actually very, very simple. What I would do here is that I'm going to calculate the distance between each of the points here and the centroid. So I'm going to calculate the distance between PI, which is any of the point here. I'm talking about cluster 1. This is cluster 1. This is cluster 2. This is cluster 3. So for cluster number 1, I have any point PI. I'm going to calculate the distance between PI and C1 and square it up. And then plus this point minus CI, or the distance between this point and C1, and then square it up and then do the same for all these data points. And that will give me the first parameter here, or the first value. 
okay? What I could do afterwards is that I can go to cluster number two and do the exact same thing. Again, calculate the distance between all of these data points, P and C1, P and C2, my apologies, P and C2, point and C2, and so on. Sum them up, we're good to go. And I can do the same as well for the third cluster too. By doing so, now I am able to calculate, again, a variable called within cluster sum of squares, okay? All right, hang in there. Let's take a look at WCSS for three different scenarios, okay? So first, I'm going to assume that I only have one big massive cluster, okay? And I'm gonna assume the number of clusters equals to one in this case. So simply put, all the points belong to the first cluster. All of them are orange. The centroid here is in the middle. And now I wanted to calculate the within cluster sum of squares. So it's simply gonna go there, go to all these points and calculate the distance between PI and C1, P and C1, and so on. And as you guys notice here, you will find that WCSS is very, very large in this case. We have a very large values for the WCSS. Why? Because the variations or the distance between all these data points and the centroid is very large because they are dispersed. They are, again, they, they are far away from the centroid because they have one massive cluster. So if you actually plot the WCSS versus the number of clusters, you will find that in general, if you, if you choose a large num if you, if you choose a very small number of clusters, like here one cluster, you will find that WCSS is very, very large initially. Okay? And what we could do afterwards here, let's assume they're gonna take these data points and divide them into two clusters. I have the orange one, C2, and I have the red one, C1, and I have here the number of clusters equals to two. I can go here and substitute in my equation and I have C1, and I have C2, and you will find that WCSS actually went down right now. Why? Because the distance between all the points and the centroid of these clusters is much less compared to here, because here the distance is really far away from the centroid because we only have one big massive cluster in this case. So I hope you guys are getting the idea. Again, if I have a very small number of clusters, WCSS will be very, very high. Here, as you increase the number of clusters, WCSS will go down a little bit. And then if I go to the third case, which is if I choose three clusters, you will find that WCSS actually goes down even more. And that's a great thing. That's a good thing. Why? Because now I have the centroid. They are very close to the number of points. So when I sum them up and square them up, you will find that WCSS actually goes down too. So what I could do right now, I can simply go ahead and plot the WCSS or the within cluster sum of squares versus the number of clusters. So if I go to number of clusters equals to one, if you guys remember, the WCSS was very, very high. And then as I move forward, as I increase the number of clusters, WCSS will go down and then WCSS will go down, 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 down. And what's beautiful about the, this technique, which is the elbow method, is that I can obtain the optimal values of K that will optimize my solution, or just give me the best results. So what I could do here is, and that's why it's called elbow method, as you find in the beginning, there is a massive drop in here, and then there is another drop. And then once the variation starts to basically become uh, negligible, you can simply select the elbow or the corner here and that will give me the optimal values of k. And then in this case, for example, k equals to three, that's the optimal number of clusters in this case. Okay, so again, what you could do, simply put, you go there, you calculate WCSS for k one, two, three, four, up until, you know, like 20 or 25. And once you see the variations here are become a little bit straight line or the variations are not, are not changing dramatically, that's where you select the optimal values of K, and that will be the optimal value that you could simply go ahead up here and plug it in here when you apply the step number one in K-means clustering algorithm. All right, okay, and that's all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In task number five, 
we are going to find the optimal number of clusters using the elbow method. And then in task number six, we are going to apply k-means clustering method. So again, it's going to be tons of fun. Please stay tuned and please enjoy Data Science for Business course. And I will see you guys in the next lecture.